Okay, guys, so it's time for the story we picked for you this morning. We're taking a closer look at the growing legal marijuana culture in America. That's right. For the first time, polls show a majority of Americans think that pot should actually be legalized and marijuana is being sold for recreational purposes in Colorado, as we know. And as attitudes have changed, so has the business and uses of marijuana. And this, of course, is all part of the Cannabis Report. Our co-host today, Ryan Nurse, doubles as our resident marijuana expert. Uh -huh. We're putting you to work, Ryan Nurse. That's right. He course... is the author of Marijuana America. What have you got for us today, Ryan? All right. So you guys know, we know about Colorado. It's marijuana mayhem. The prohibition is over, right? Yes. But, um, and so many pot tourists have flocked to the state that recreational dispensaries have actually, you know, running out of weed at this point. We talked about that earlier in the week, right? Yep. But yet there are still hundreds of inmates in Colorado's prisons for weed offenses, right? Of course. There's very strange sort of irony there. And um, what's even more disconcerting about this is that very few people are writing about it. Mm -hmm. um, but we found one guy who did. And his name is Matt Fleischer. He's a journalist who writes about social justice issues. And we asked him to explain to us the situation in Colorado. Check out what he had to Let's say. Let's take a look. Well, between 2006 and 2010 in Colorado, there were 50,000 marijuana-related arrests. Now, how many of those actually went to prison remains to be seen. But uh, the fact is that none of those convictions will be expunged based on the new marijuana legalization law um, because, because that law does not guarantee what's called retroactive ameliorative sentencing. Uh, meaning that if you committed the crime uh, when it was still on the books, then you're stuck with it uh, even after um, marijuana becomes legalized. Wow. So what he's saying, people that are in jail will stay in jail, and we don't really know how many people there are. Right. And secondly, it won't be expunged from your record, so it may be harder for you to get a job. Yeah, yeah. And, exactly. and the numbers are pretty crazy. In 25 years, 210,000 people were arrested just in Colorado because of, like, with marijuana-related cases. And in the past, I don't know, between 2006 and 2010, over 50,000 people. It's a lot of arrests, right? A lot. Imagine how frustrated you'd be if you were in prison right now <laughs> for a weed offense, knowing that everyone's out there just yeah. smoking up a ton of weed and having fun with it and there's this big change in the general take on it and you're still in jail for yeah, it. Yeah, but like Mighty said, we don't know how many of them are still in jail. That's but true. That's, that's right. true. Uh, you a, lot, a lot of them are just possession charges and they end up, you know, getting a little fine and going on their way. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, Matt also told us that a uh, few states like Connecticut and New Mexico um, have even repealed the death penalty but still left prisoners on death row. So this j isn't just a, a marijuana issue. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, and it's got to be a major bummer in that case, of course. Oh, my God. So they still, they're still going to execute these people? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's oh not God. a lot of people. There were, like, two, like two in Connecticut. Row, yeah. yeah, exactly. Two on death row. But we were curious about um, if other countries have this thing, um, which is, you know, called retroactive ameliorative relief. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a mouthful. And Matt Fleischer, who we just talked to, said America is actually one of the few that doesn't. Uh, the United States is only one of 22 countries around the world that doesn't guarantee this kind of retroactive ameliorative sentencing. Um, uh, Pakistan, Myanmar, Oman, uh, and um, a few smaller uh, Caribbean countries are, are pretty much the only ones um, whose company we enjoy. Um, and not exactly bastions of, of social justice. So, um, yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty isolated in this regard and not guaranteeing this, these rights. You know, I, I'm really shocked that, like, even Russia, a country that is so narrow-minded in every right. single aspect, they now have retro retroactive relief. I mean, apparently right. over 700 people have been taken off of death row, for example, just in Russia because of this measurement. Same thing with South, South Africa. It's another country that's not very open. Yeah. Over 400 people have already gotten out of death row. Yeah. But I, I just think one point that needs to be clear, we're talking about these people went to jail because they broke the law. It's not necessarily about marijuana or about selling weed. It's about... Right. They did you break broke the, the law. law. You bro broke the law at the time. At the time. Now, are there some signs, Ryan, of of change, for example, in, in states like California? Yeah, they have, a new, um, they have a new law in California, and they are starting to change. They're starting to let people off after the fact. But it's just California. It's one state. But, you know, maybe the, this uh, Colorado thing will, will bring some more attention to it. More lawyers, more legislators will start this retroactive ameliorative relief. What about pending investigations that involve marijuana possession? Um, pending investigations? I mean, um, yeah, it's... Uh, I don't know much about that, actually. No, I'm not I think I read, 
I, br I bring it up because uh, Matthew, the, or right. the, the author that you interviewed, he also said that there's a move to drop current investigations mm -hmm. related uh, right. to... Related oh, yes, to yes, in yeah. Colorado. Yeah, the pending investigations, they are dropping those, and they're, and they're letting those go. The federal government can always continue to pursue them, but the yeah. state government now in Colorado is letting those go oh, for the time being. Oh, of course, there's being. that dichotomy between yes. federally and, and then what the states want to do. Exactly. A yeah, lot yeah. more to talk about that. Fascinating. We're taking a look at the future of marijuana in sports. And surprisingly, we're focusing on the button-down corporate world of the NFL. Every so often, a player from the NBA or NFL comes out saying a high percentage of the league uses marijuana. But never before has a league commissioner said anything favorable about marijuana until now, That's guys. Right. That's it was... right, Giannis. Last week, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell said that he could envision a time when players use medical marijuana to treat pain in states where it is legal, of course. We're joined now live from New York by former AP White House correspondent and current media strategist for Mercury, Ben Feller. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thank you for being here. Good morning to you all. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Ben. Now, Ben, Roger Goodell made these comments to you during an interview. Would you say he's opening a door for medical marijuana in the NFL? Well, it's really interesting. When I asked the commissioner if he could envision a day where he would allow medical marijuana to be used in the states that allow it. He did not come right out and say yes by any means, but the fact that he didn't outright shoot it down is what's causing all the buzz. He said, you know, we're going to continue to support, to support the evolution of medicine. And that phrase got a lot of people's attention because it seemed to open the door. Now, I don't think that's how the NFL necessarily sees it. Was it shocking to you? It, it was surprising to me that it was so sort of open-ended, uh, you know, supporting where medicine goes. I think I was actually more surprised about the reaction to it because, as you said, it's being interpreted as uh, him being supportive of it, him opening the door to it, and that's a whole different conversation for the NFL. Hmm. Yeah, we wanted to hear from, uh, from former players on the issue, uh, and we spoke to a former seven-time Pro Bowler and Super Bowl champion Lomas Brown, we asked him, what percentage of NFL players use marijuana? Well, uh, again, I would say at least 50%, at the least. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's just something that is really becoming a cultural change. And, you know, again, the NFL, they have to protect their logo. They have to protect their image. But, you know, I say at least 50% of the players smoke. You heard that, uh, Ben? Loma says, Loma says 50%. What do you think about that number, 50%? I think that's a, that's a startling number. You know, I mean, he, he would know much better than those of us outside the league, but if it's anywhere near that high, you know, th that poses a huge question for the NFL. I mean, the NFL is very sensitive on this issue. Drug testing is a big part of their program. You know, most of the debate is usually around performance-enhancing drugs. You know, marijuana obviously is not in that same category. Uh, but they don't want to be attached to the drug issue at all. To have a former player with the stature of Lomas Brown say, you know, one out of two players is doing it, that's really amazing to me. And we also asked Lomas Brown if he thinks that medical marijuana, Ben, would be a viable alternative to the painkillers that are commonly doled out by team doctors. Let's hear from him first. And I would just think that uh, the use of marijuana for pain uh, management, it would be a far better uh, outcome to me than it would be for the abuse of, you know, say, heavy narcotics like pills or Vikes or Percocets or whatever the pill of choice is for pain now in the NFL. So, Ben, obviously the NFL has had a problem with pain meds for years. Could this be a viable alternative down the road, you think? Well, I think the real question is going to be when the commissioner talks about the NFL being willing to follow the evolution of medicine, it's really more like the evolution of politicians. You know, we're seeing these states increasingly adopt laws that allow for medical marijuana use, but it varies by the state. You know, some places just aren't ready to do that, even if the medicine is proven. And I think that's the question for the NFL. Right now, their deal with players says it's not allowed, period. We're going to have to see whether the culture of the NFL, the culture of a place run by Roger Goodell with the players, is ready to adopt that and allow treatments like the kind Lomas Brown is talking about. They're not there yet. Uh, now, Ben, you just mentioned the difference between states' policies and laws. The NFL's rules only outlaws the illegal use of mari marijuana. 
but it's already legal in Colorado and it will soon be legal also in Washington, for example. Is this a loophole that gives Broncos and Seahawks players the right to smoke weed in a way? I don't think the NFL would would see it that way. I mean, it's a it's a gray area in the sense that, as you say, it's against illegal marijuana. So if a state says, hey, we are allowed to prescribe it to our patients, you know, arguably that could be legal. But you, you got to remember that the NFL is a very powerful workplace and the way they see it, they have a deal with the players. If you want to be an NFL player, if you want to have the privilege of you know, playing for the shield, as they call it, you got to honor our rules. It's not about what the state legislature says. And under our rules, you're not allowed to take it. And they would see that as illegal. And I think that's where the debate is going to go. So the next opportunity to renegotiate for players' use of medical marijuana uh, doesn't happen until 2021. Do you expect more comments uh, like Roger Goodell's in the coming years, in the coming months? I expect a lot more questions about this. I mean, this for me, doing that interview with the commissioner, uh, I asked about a lot of things that got fans interest, but this particular one, would he be open to a day of allowing medical marijuana, as long as it's legal in the States, is getting more attention by the day. I think it's only gonna generate more questions. You're gonna hear more players and former players talking about it, uh, and that might force the issue. That's usually what happens with these things. It's not so much the duration of the contract, it's how quickly a debate can catch fire. You've seen it in state legislatures. Things are moving very fast. I think this is going to be one that the NFL is going to have to continue to address before that deal comes up again. Ben thank Feller, you so thank much. you so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Uh, DJ Mr. Powers, Electropico, welcome back Mr. to the morning Power. show. And now for everybody's favorite Friday segment. We're <laughs> taking a look at the growing legal marijuana culture in America. For the first time ever, polls show a majority of Americans think that pot should be legalized. And as attitudes have changed, so has the business and uses of marijuana. We're going to bring you some of these great stories every single week in a segment we're calling the Canna Business Report. We're joined now by author of Marijuana America and Eat This Book, our producer, Ryan Nurse, looking very, very normal You're in Miami. Very today. <laughs> Welcome, Ryan. Almost didn't recognize you. <laughs> what is this all about? Yeah. What's your um, story today? Driving Stone. We're going to talk about that. Um, have you guys ever heard of a DUID? No. no. I've heard okay. of a DUI, it's but like, not a DUI. Deal. Exactly. It's like a DUI, but for drugs. And it's <laughs> becoming a big, big issue because I'm in all these medical marijuana states. There's 20 of them now. They're trying to figure out what it means to be um, driving stoned or driving impaired. And it's, it's a lot more complicated than alcohol, which is very distinct. It's usually the laws are very different. Yeah. So every state has different things. And uh, we made a short animated video to give you a sense of just how complicated and how different the state laws are. Wonderful. So check it out. Buckle up, people. We're about to be riding high. Turns out the penalties for driving stoned vary from state to state. Let's say our friend Roland Grass kicks off a road trip by smoking a joint in Los Angeles, but then gets pulled over. Luckily, California has effect-based laws, which means his driving ability has to be demonstrably impaired to get punished. Then he hits Nevada, pulled over again, and this time there's a drug test. The state's per se legal limit is 10 nanograms. He beats that and heads off to Utah. Unfortunately, Utah has a zero tolerance policy. So when he gets stopped there, it's a night in jail for Roland. Next morning, he posts bond and sets out for Colorado, where even though weed is legal, a new law sets a five nanogram limit. Roland clocks in at two nanograms and sets off for a weed dispensary. Mm. Ah, uh, watch the morning show where we teach you how to get away with smoking and driving. <laughs> if you did take state. notes fast enough, the video is posted online, people. Yes. Don't panic. <laughs> yeah, so you get what it's like. So there's these, uh, uh, increasingly there's these per se laws, which is, is similar to alcohol, where that's five nanograms, 10 nanograms actually test your urine or your blood. And uh, for example, in Washington and Colorado, where it's legal recreationally, it's five nanograms, which is not very much. But aside from the law, how does someone drive high? How, how uh, like, like, what does it do to you? Like, right. 
Well, um, there's a lot of a uh, lot of different theories about that. For one thing, there's some there's some tests that is, have said that actually people are a little more cautious. You know, there's that thing of like people going really slow. Oh, when you the start, stop like, sign. you panic a little. Yeah, so th that can be dangerous too. But then there's a lot of people. It, it does affect your psychomotor uh, capabilities, and there's a lot of like going outside the lines, things like that. But and it's we not have an reckless. example here of someone driving, don't we? We do. We do? Yeah. Is it somebody from the morning show? Please tell me. No, it's not. It's not me. Um, <laughs> We're not no. going to show a crime here. <laughs> yeah, they have this woman who's uh, driving on a closed course, and you can get a sense of why it's probably not a good idea. Let's to check drive it out. Stone. I hit a cone. Oh, I hit a cone. I see it in the rear view mirror. Ah! <laughs> I didn't even hit the brake. Straight ahead. Straight ahead, yeah. Oh, Puffers. Wait, now? She went around that curve pretty, pretty fast. And, um,. So, her ability is mostly deteriorating. Way more stone. Way more stone. That would For all these years, I stole my parents' vehicle. Oh, that, that cone could have been a person. That's another cone. It could have been a person. Dangerous, dangerous. Yeah, it's she not was a good having idea. a good time. But Did we know what type of weed they gave it? There's a lot of different types now. That seemed like yeah. strong weed, let me it's tell you. It's true. Well, was it, it is strong. Icky, the granddaddy purple? What was it? <laughs> yeah, well, this is in Washington State where they have that kind of stuff. So this is probably, you're right, though. There's sativa, there's indica. But sativa. how is a cop supposed to know someone is high? I think um, they know, right? Well, it's a pretty good question. Now they have a lot of these states are employing drug recognition experts, as they call them. If they get to a scene and they smell marijuana or they think someone's, you know, eyes are dilated, um, they bring in these DREs, as they're called. So we actually talked to a guy from Miami Dade. He's a DRE. Wow. He said, if you're looking for it, his name is Richard Clocious. He says, when they look for it, it's in the eyes a lot, but there's a particular thing that's peculiar to marijuana, and it's this. Listen to this. Another symptom that is peculiar to the cannabis class of drugs is what we call eyelid tremors. When the head is tilted back and the eyes are closed, you'll see the eyelid shake very noticeably. When you see it, you'll know what it is. So again, if you weren't able to take notes, the video will be posted <laughs> online. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean... How were your eyes while you were interviewing him? I, I was working on not having <laughs> eyelid tremors the whole time. I was like, I can beat this test. But this is really an important issue because, yeah. well, when I lived in Connecticut for a little while, this was an activity that kids, like, did. This yeah. was, like, a Friday activity. Like, let's get high. Hey, I didn't yeah. partake in it, mm -hmm. no? But let's make it clear. It's true. And, you know, my buddy who lives in Colorado was saying he's seen a real rise since medical marijuana came in there of people just sort of being random on the road. Like, he has guys will just stop in the middle of the road or, you know, they will be, you know, go down to, like, 40 miles an hour in a 60 mile an hour and it's a little erratic so it's good that they're trying to crack down on it yeah, yeah. thank you ryan thank that you was so wonderful. much don't you. smoke and drive no. please do not just not be sober all. when you drive just watch the morning show while yeah. you do it do you remember what we talked about at the beginning of the show if you don't you're not alone we'll explain it on today's a cluttered mind we'll be back with more right after this tweet us Woo! at fusion morning you're watching the morning show don't go anywhere it's a fancy show it's a foxy show it's a nifty show oh fancy and foxy and nifty <laughs> for a nifty time